The views and opinions expressed on America's Workforce Union podcast and its digital media channels are solely those of the speakers and do not necessarily represent the views and opinions of the producers or sponsors. Welcome to the America's Workforce Radio Podcast, the flagship production of the American Workers Radio and Podcast Network, where organized labor and its never-ending fight to protect the rights of the American worker come first. Now, presented by LIUNA, Laborers International Union of North America, here's your host, Ed Flash Ferrens. Communication workers, 25,000 of them ratify new contracts with AT&T. Meanwhile, Teamsters in California demand that Amazon recognize their union. And today on the show, the latest from the Michigan AFL-CIO and our independent labor voice, Tom Buffenbarger. Welcome to the Tuesday, October 22nd edition of America's Workforce, where we are available on at least five platforms, including YouTube, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spotify, and Pandora. Many ways that you can get America's Workforce. We have two guests on the show today. We're going to start things off with Ron Bieber. Ron is president of the Michigan Labor Federation, the state AFL-CIO, and here's a guy who has devoted his entire career, his entire career, to fighting for working families. He was elected president of the State Labor Federation in June of 2015. Four years later, he was reelected and then reelected last September to his third term. Ron joined UAW Local 730. This was back in 1978 after hiring into General Motors Metal fabrication plant. This was in Wyoming, Michigan. He was elected to his first union position at the age of 23. He moved up the ranks, being appointed to the UAW international staff. That was in 92. In 2009, Ron Bieber was promoted as an administrative assistant to the UAW president and named the director of the UAW cap department in that position. His responsibilities included the administration of the political, retired workers, and civil rights departments of the UAW. And you may recall that name, Bieber. His dad, Owen Bieber, was president for some time for the United Auto Workers. A couple things we're going to talk about. Home health care workers in Michigan just won back their bargaining rights. And this all has to do, all has to do with the end of right to work in Michigan. Their right to organize was taken away back in 2012 by an anti-worker legislature, and they have been fighting ever since. Ron is going to tell us that whole story. And sadly, Michigan has a crisis in the home care workforce. Home care workers are paid $13.53 an hour on average. You cannot make a living on $13.53 an hour. In fact, a recent analysis projected that without action, the shortage in home care workers could balloon to 200,000 over the next two years. Also, victory for workers on minimum wage increases and earned paid sick leave, again, because of the end of right to work. And also, you gotta thank the Michigan Supreme Court they delivered a huge win for workers over the summer. Ron will talk about that. And lastly, Michigan is moving forward, not backward like some states, going forward on cracking down on child labor. As you know, illegal child labor violations are on the rise all over the country. And a lot of states, especially down south, are lowering the age for kids to work. And in many cases, these kids are working in very dangerous environments. Well, Michigan, what they're doing here is trying to uh, increase the penalties when companies violate child labor laws. And Ron's going to talk about that. Our second guest on the show, longtime contributor to America's workforce, and that would be uh, Tom Buffenbarger, retired general president of the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers. And he, once again, is going to talk about Boeing the company in dire straits, they finally came up with another offer. We talked about this on the show yesterday. 
We're talking uh, IAM District 751 and W24 out in the Pacific Northwest. Now, according to the tentative agreement, which will be voted on tomorrow, the workers will get a 35% general wage increase that will be spread over four years. Now, Tom will take a look at the details on that, and he has negotiated a number of a number of contracts over the years with the machinists, and he's got a very interesting relationship with Boeing. He has seen how the culture of that company has changed over the years, so he'll speak to that as well as our second guest on the show. Now, a brief look into the world of labor. This segment brought to you by Boyd Watterson Asset Management. You can find more at BoydWatterson.com. Over 25,000 members of the Communication Workers of America across 11 states have ratified strong new contract agreements with AT&T Southeast and AT&T West. After their prior contract expired in early August, workers in the nine AT&T Southeast states engage in a month-long strike to force the company to engage in good-faith bargaining. AT&T workers, including Technicians, customer service reps, and others who install, maintain, and support the network will receive wage increases of at least 15% over the course of the new four-year collective bargaining agreement in the West and over 19% during the five-year agreement in the Southeast. Now, in the contract that covers the Southeast, wiretechs, and utility operations professionals who will be essential, essential to fulfilling the nationwide broadband build-out underway as part of President Biden's infrastructure bill will receive an additional 3% wage boost. The contracts covering both AT&T Southeast and AT&T West include significant improvements to overtime and scheduling practices, addressing a key concern of the technicians who install and troubleshoot AT&T fiber networks in homes and businesses. Now, these techs often cited unreasonable expectations for the time needed to complete work assignments, too many assignments being added to their work schedule throughout the day, and overscheduling of weekend shifts, all of which contributed not only to their own diminishing work-life balance, but the level and quality of customer service they were able to provide. So that was a big issue. Claude Cummings Jr. is the president of the CWA, and he said our members were clear right from the start. Every member at AT AT&T has value, and no one, no one should be treated like a second-class employee. These contracts provide our members with family-supporting wages and benefits, and address long-standing concerns about overtime and overscheduling, which not only kept them away from their families and unable to plan their own lives, it negatively affected the quality of service for our members that they wanted to deliver. Claude Cummings, president of the CWA, cwa cwa-union.org is the national website, also one of the many proud sponsors here on America's Workforce. Let's go to a Victorville, California, where hundreds of Teamster drivers, this would be at the Amazon DFX4 facility in Victorville, all demanding that Amazon recognize their union and start negotiating a contract to address low pay and dangerous working conditions. Isaiah Mao is one of the workers, and he said, we are organizing as Amazon Teamsters to win the fair pay, safe jobs, and respect that we deserve. Amazon has a whole lot of money, but we as workers have the power, and we're holding this company accountable. This march on the boss, as they called it in Victorville, is the latest example of Amazon workers rising up and making their voices heard in the face of unsafe working conditions, low pay, and unstable job schedules. Drivers at four of the facility's delivery service partner locations are all organizing with the Teamsters. Dan Herrera is another Teamster speaking out. He said, we deliver in the desert 
during heat waves. And Amazon doesn't take our safety seriously. This company doesn't treat us like human beings, but we know our worth. We are uniting with other Teamsters at Amazon and across the industry to make sure our safety is prioritized over Amazon's profits. Well, this year alone, hundreds of Amazon drivers in New York City and warehouse workers in San Francisco did, in fact, join the Teamsters, while workers in Kentucky and California walked off the job in protest of the company's unfair labor practices. The growing momentum is inspiring more Amazon workers to join the union from rural towns to even big cities. And all of this comes alongside the victory, a monumental victory achieved by Amazon drivers. This was in uh, Palmdale, California, who secured a National Labor Relations Board determination that Amazon is, in fact, the joint employer of the drivers at all of its facilities and therefore has a legal duty to recognize and bargain with the Teamsters. I'll tell you, this is a long, long battle that's been going on with the company. And I'll tell you, the Teamsters are definitely making some progress. So congratulations to the International Brotherhood of Teamsters on this one. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to check in with Ron Bieber, president of the Michigan Labor Federation. You're listening to America's Workforce with Ed Flash Ferrens. It takes Lyuna to build North America's infrastructure. From roads and bridges to schools and skyscrapers, the men and women of Lyuna, the Laborers International Union of North America, build the projects we depend on. From constructing the Freedom Tower on the site of the former World Trade Center to untangling Washington, D.C.'s congested interstate, Lyuna members do the work that matters. Find out what it takes to be built by Lyuna at lyuna.org. That's L-I-U-N-A dot org. This portion of the show brought to you by the International Union of Bricklayers and Allied Craft Workers. For more information, please visit BACWeb.org. There is unity and strength for workers. We are the U.S. We are the USW. The, the United, United Steel Workers. The largest industrial union in North America. We represent 850,000 members in, in the, the U.S., US Canada, Canada, and the, the Caribbean. Caribbean. We work in metals, rubber, chemicals, paper, oil refining, atomic energy, and the service sector. We are steel workers, standing strong and fighting for what's right. America's Workforce appreciates our sponsor, the Columbus Central Ohio Building and Construction Trades Council, who represents more than 18,000 workers from 19 affiliated local unions and district councils. Melwood is a dynamic nonprofit organization, providing jobs and great opportunities for people with disabilities. And they do this through strategic partnerships with the federal government, unions, and community partners. Melwood is all about advancing economic independence for workers with disabilities, and they've been doing this for more than 60 years in Washington, D.C. and the surrounding area. Learn more about Melwood by visiting their website, melwood.org. America's Workforce Radio is sponsored in part by the International Union of Painters and Allied Trades, District Council 6, representing painters, glazers, drywall finishers, and sign and display industry workers. They remind you that belonging to a union is your right as an American. America's Workforce is presented by the Labor's International Union of North America. Feel the power right now at liuna.org. Now, back to Ed Flash Ferrens with America's Workforce. And remember, you can check us out on Facebook or follow us on X, formerly known as Twitter. That would be AWF Union Podcast. By the way, this next segment brought to you in part by the Ohio Federation of Teachers, oh.aft.org. Let's go to line number one. Welcome our featured guest. Love talking to this guy. Ron Bieber is his name. In fact, at one time, his dad was president of the giant UAW, United Auto Workers. And he is now the president of the Michigan State Labor Federation. Website, real simple, M-I-A-F-L-C-I-O dot O-R-G. Ron Bieber, welcome back to America's Workforce. And I have to tell you, buddy, I've been talking a whole lot about Michigan because here in the state of Ohio, we have an issue called Issue 1 on our ballot, which would end gerrymandering. And uh, I have heard many, many stories that it's kind of modeled after what you did in Michigan 
which resulted in the end of Right to Work. And so I got to congratulate you. That was earlier this year. Finally, finally, Right to Work came to an end in the great state of Michigan. So thanks for joining us today. And how are we doing? I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's some lawmakers saying we should go back to Right to Work. Is any of that happening, Ron? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. None, none that are my friends, though. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they've been crying the blues ever since, with no data to show that it's costed anybody anything. But yeah, they've been crying the blues on the other side ever since. 60 years, first time in 60 years, anybody's undid right to work. And um, yeah, we're pretty happy here to have that finally take effect. And I got to say, Ed, I am rooting for you guys in Ohio. My good friend Tim Berger down there, I tell him all the time, that's the thing here. When we change that, redistricting um, law here and made it that we had fair elections, that was a linchpin to yep. workers taking back power and be able to do things like that. Yeah. So I'm rooting for you folks in Ohio. Um, prop one down there. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's so funny you mentioned, Tim, because for the last, I mean, six to nine months, every conversation I had with him is citizens, not politicians. Issue one, we got to do that. We got to change the gerrymandering in the state of Ohio. So we're, and right now, I, uh, there is a majority of people, they did some polling on this, and it's close to 70% saying, you know what, the system we have right now, it ain't working. We got to change it. So I'm keeping my fingers crossed on that one. Hey, you know, let's talk about what has changed in Michigan because of the change in the legislature. I want to start off with these home health care workers which uh, just won back their bargaining rights. Ron, I'll let you pick it up from there. Tell me the story on this one. Yeah, thanks. Uh, in, this is a great story. In 2012, the Lansing politicians that were in power at the time, again, who weren't friends of mine, thought differently than me. We had uh, health, home health care workers had the right to form a union, had the right to bargain for better wages and working conditions, and they took it away. They took it away from them when there was this big power grab um, to take rights away from working people and and labor. That was a piece of it at that time. It was wrong then, and it's wrong today. And, um, you know, we've been working really hard to restore workers' rights and make Michigan a workers' rights state again. And we weren't done <laughs> uh, when we got right to work repealed. So that was one of the things we wanted was to get those uh, collective bargaining rights that were stolen from those home health care workers to over 10 years ago back. And um, and we just did it. Recently, uh, the law passed through the legislature and was signed by the governor. This fixes a whole bunch of problems that Michigan's got a home care crisis. We're an aging population and there's a shrinking workforce to care for these uh elderly people now. And it's hardly a surprise because the pay is abysmal, the work is hard, and the benefits are non-existent. So this will restore those those workers' rights to unionize and not only do the right thing by these workers, it's going to improve working conditions and pay, which in turn is going to help attract and retain more workers in that field, right? Which means mm -hmm. that our seniors and most vulnerable are going to get better care. Yeah, the pay is atrocious. I'm reading uh, many of them are only paid $13.53 an hour. And anybody listening right now knows you can't exist on a wage like that. So it's no surprise that they're leaving the profession. And, and to your point, too, I guess there was a, a study done projected that without action, if, if they didn't raise the pay, the shortage in home care workers could balloon to 200,000 over the next two years. That's a crisis. So with that being said, where do we stand right now? They have the right to organize. They, they have a right to join the union that, that was stripped away from them. Is that happening right now? Are the unions descending upon them and making this, uh, making this a better life for them? It just passed. That, that bill just, we're the legislature, we got a full-time legislature, but obviously they're down this time in an election cycle. They're not in much. Yeah. They're not in session much. It just it just passed. They came back one day in September and it passed. So it's just it just passed. It was just signed by the governor a couple of weeks ago. Gotcha. So it's just getting off the ground. But but yeah, they're gonna move fast. Um 
to get these workers those rights back and and again it's just restoring workers rights that we had right so it's the right thing and frankly <laughs> I'm getting, I'm, I'm getting, my hair is pretty gray these days and I may need, <laughs> uh, it, so this is a good thing. Um, but seriously, like you said, a 200,000 worker shortfall in this, just in this area, that's a crisis. Yeah. That's an absolute crisis. Yeah. Well, you know, when it comes to healthcare in general, I've been hearing so many stories, you too, I'm sure about the whole industry. It's going from nonprofit to profit. And as a result, people are getting screwed over left and right, including the workers in the profession. I mean, nurses know. And retention is an issue there, too. They know what needs to be done. Staffing. It's got to be increased. And, and you know what? I'm probably the same age as you, buddy. I'm getting worried on this end, too, <laughs> because we're going to need some help. <laughs> we're, we're not getting younger. This is crazy. Yeah, no, exactly. And I, this, it is nuts. I just spoke to a, a nurses conference a week ago, and I've said that I've since COVID ended, I have been to more nurses rallies over struggling to get collective bargaining agreements than any other profession. Those folks sacrificed, put their lives on the line for us during COVID. Yeah. And I thought, you know, they were hailed as heroes. And I thought of anybody when we came out, boy, they're going to get rewarded, you know, for the heroes that they were. And it's been, at least in Michigan, it's been the exact opposite. And, for, and they've struggled harder than anybody to get decent, um, collective bargaining agreements and it, it's sick, but it's for the reason, one of the reasons you said that it's, it's corporate, uh, corporate medicine. Now it's taken and it's greed and it's just taken control. And nurses are saying, why, you know, why, why would I do this when I'm going to be treated this way? We have a safe staffing bill that's been introduced in Michigan for nurses and, and healthcare workers, you know, that their working conditions are abysmal and, you know, their safety conditions are, I was in a meeting last, not with nurses, but with and another board I sit in where they went over um, safety records. The nursing profession is like the top third most dangerous, which I would have never thought. Yeah. But, yeah. but it is for injury. And nurses, I want to add to that. They are the most respected every year. There's polling done on who's you know, who's the most respected firefighters are way up there police are pretty far yeah, up there nurses have always been number one for and for all the right reasons yeah. for all those well so let's treat yeah. them like that okay if you're going to be number one yeah. pay them come on right exactly and i i say this every time i talk to a group of them i had i was in my 30s probably mid 30s had two young kids i had a had a uh, personal health care crisis, an emergency, went in uh, 10 days. I was in the hospital, not a morsel of food, not a drop of water, not an ice chip. I thought I wasn't walking out of that hospital. Those, those nurses were angels walking on earth. I, and I've said that ever since then. I wouldn't have made it through there. I had made my peace. I wasn't leaving there. Um, yeah, but those, I wouldn't have got through it without those yeah. nurses. Yeah. Not just for the physical care. But the mental uh, care that they gave me through that, that there are angels walking on there. Yeah, there's a special person for that. There's no doubt about that. Hey, while we're talking about wages here, uh, I, I'm reading about a victory for workers on a minimum wage increase and in earned paid sick leave. And apparently this has to do with uh, an issue at the Michigan Supreme Court delivering a pretty big win. Can you give me some details on that, Ron? This is huge. This is huge. And this is another reason. During a dark period here from 2010 to 2018, we had one of the worst Supreme Courts in the country for being rigged, rigged against workers. And eventually through the political process, it got turned around. And now you know, a work, working people have a fair shake on the court today. But this is a sad story. In 2018, there was a group that went out and collected petition signatures to get a $15 minimum wage and earn paid sick leave on the ballot. And they got enough signatures in Michigan. When you do that, it's called a citizens initiated law. When your signatures are submitted and then you have enough, it goes to the legislature. They've got first shot at it. They can pass it into law. They can um, put on a competing ballot proposal of their own, or they can do nothing and it just goes to the ballot. In this instance, there, weren't, there was not, again, not a worker-friendly legislature 
controlling Lansing, they passed that into law, knowing full well that they didn't want that, but they passed it. Mm -hmm. And then there was something called, they called it adopt and amend. So they then changed it at, after the election that year. They they went and they they adopted it, but before it could take effect, they gutted it. Through the legislature, they gutted it. It's it's a despicable practice. And frankly, there was an attorney general's opinion that said you couldn't do that. But in any event, they did it and they, they just gutted it and you know took it took the citizens initiated law away from the citizens to have a vote on it. And it's been in court ever since. Um, so for six years, this has made its ways through the court. And finally, this court uh, delivered a huge win for workers this summer. And they ruled that that 2018 move to adopt and, and amend, uh, we call the bait and switch, was unconstitutional. So that means starting next year, Michigan workers earning the minimum wage, it's going to start going up over the next four years till it gets to that $15 mm-hmm. and the paid sick leave is going to start to accrue. So huge victory for workers here and all oh God, the business community is crying the blues because it's not going to go into effect until next February. They want the legislature to now weaken it. Um, everything's going to, every business in Michigan is going to go out of business. And oh, here's yeah. my question. And this is, <laughs> this is what really, really, who's worried about, those workers who got screwed for the last six years, who didn't get those wages that had they not done that, that were stolen from them. Right. Right. I, I can tell you, I, I am. And there's others too who are saying, no, 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 we we, these workers earned this and they deserve it. I'm sure you've heard the stories time and time again about raising wages and how that is going to be devastating to the economy. Can't do that. It's going to drive people. First of all, they're going to have to, less people work and businesses are going to go out of business. You know, California, they raised their uh, minimum wage to $20 and they did a study on that and they found out, well, yeah, the price of a cheeseburger went up about 15 cents, 10 to 15 cents, something like that. But there was no loss in employment at all. It, it, it seems to be working okay. But nonetheless, those stories just keep coming and coming and coming. Yeah. And I'm sure that if, uh, you know, if you're going to spend and, and have you, you've seen the prices of hamburgers lately. Okay. <laughs> 15 cents is, is not what you call a huge increase in the price of a cheeseburger right? in, in today's, uh, in today's dollars. Yeah. Ron, I got to take a quick break. Ron Bieber joining us on our live line today. He is the president of the Michigan state AFL CIO. M-I-A-F-L-C-I-O dot O-R-G. M-I-A-F-L-C-I-O is also their handle on X, formerly known as Twitter. We'll continue. Actually, uh, Michigan is also moving forward on cracking down on child labor. That story and what they're doing to get out the vote. We'll talk about that next right here on America's Workforce. This is America's Workforce. It takes Lyuna to power North America with affordable energy. The men and women of Lyuna, the Laborers International Union of North America, have the skills needed to build and maintain oil, natural gas, nuclear, solar, and wind projects that are shaping America's energy future. From new energy tech to retrofitted facilities, Lyuna members do it all. Find out what it takes to be powered by Lyuna at Lyuna.org. That's L-I-U-N-A dot org. This segment of the show is brought to you by the Brotherhood of Maintenance of Way Employees Division of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters. For more information, please visit bmwe.org. The Iron Workers Great Lakes District Council, consisting of eight iron worker local unions in West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Michigan. We build the skylights and bridges along the Great Lakes. With more work than ever before, the Great Lakes District Council is actively searching out the next great iron worker. Whether it's building the next Intel plant or constructing a bridge to safely connect our great cities along the lake. So join the Iron Workers Great Lakes District Council today. Find out how and learn more about the council by visiting iwdistrictcouncil.com. America's Workforce is brought to you in part by the Communication Workers of America. You can find more at cwa-union.org. Attention members of the Heat and Frost Insulators Union who are interested in traveling. Central Ohio has more construction projects on the books than anywhere in the U.S. Mega projects, large and medium-sized jobs are creating more work 
than our local 50 brothers and sisters can handle. Projects like Intel, the Honda LG battery plant, and multiple data centers for Facebook, Google, and Amazon offer union wages, overtime, and exciting incentives. Local 50 is seeking union travelers to meet the needs of its signatory contractors who can put you to work immediately. If you're a member in good standing and interested in the work opportunities in Central Ohio, visit insulators50.com forward slash AWF travel for more information. America's Workforce is brought to you in part by the International Federation of Professional and Technical Engineers. You can find more at ifpte.org. The Alliance for American Manufacturing is a nonprofit, nonpartisan partnership formed back in 2007 by some of America's leading manufacturers and the United Steelworkers. Their mission is simple strengthen American manufacturing and create new private sector jobs through smart public policies. Keyword there is smart. We need to be smarter than ever in today's highly competitive world. The Alliance for American American Manufacturing believes that an innovative and growing manufacturing base is vital to America's economic and national security, as well as providing good jobs for future generations. Good jobs today, good jobs tomorrow. Good American jobs. Find out more at AmericanManufacturing.org. This is America's Workforce. More shows available at awfradio.com. And remember, you can check us out on at least five platforms. That includes YouTube, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spotify, and Pandora. And when you get an opportunity, here's what you do. Just sign up and receive our shows on a regular basis and give us a rating. We always, always appreciate those five-star ratings. So keep them coming. And thank you for uh, making America's Workforce the number one union podcast in all of America. We started podcasting a little over four years ago. We are in the top 1% of all podcasts. There's 2 million podcasts out there right now. But when it comes to labor issues, we are number one. So thank you. And I always say it's because of what we bring to the table when it comes to guests. Ron Bieber being one of those. He's the president of the Michigan State AFL-CIO. We've been talking about all the good things that have been happening in Michigan since they got rid of right to work, which was official at the beginning of this year in the, uh, the late part of winter. And uh, Ron, I want to talk to you about moving forward on uh, cracking down on child labor. Sadly, we're seeing this uh, pop up in a number of states, mainly in the South. And in fact, I just had a story recently. This was out of Tennessee, where they enshrined right to work in their state constitution, mind you. And we've got kids, 13 year olds working in a sawmill at six in the morning. I'm saying, wait a minute, what the heck is wrong with this? And I have to wonder what the parents are doing about that, because this is a sad situation. There was a time where child labor was pretty predominant in the United States. And then unions came along and said, hey, no way. And now we seem to be going back to that time. So talk to me about what's going on in Michigan here with uh, child labor. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Can you believe it's 2024 and we're even talking about this? It's crazy. And a lot of other states that are are making laws to making child labor laws weaker. Uh, But we're trying to make Michigan a workers' rights state again here. And we're trying to do things to protect kids who are are working. Like you said, uh, I think a dozen states have introduced measures to weaken child labor protections. We're bucking that trend. It's it's disturbing that they would go that route. And we're going to try and dr- dramatically increase penalties for these companies that would put children at risk. We had on the west side of the state, a 17-year-old kid working on third shift using a meat processor that he shouldn't even have been using because of his age. Mm-hmm. He lost his hand. He lost his hand in that meat processor. That company was fined 1000 $143 for a child, by by law, a child running a meat processor and losing their hand, $1,000. Do you think that's a deterrent <laughs> to that employer? <laughs> nope. It's a calculated business risk, right? They're going, wow, that, was, you know, that didn't take much. So what we're going to try, well, what we are going to do here is increase the penalties to make them a deterrent. Like I said, that fine for that hand under this new bill, if if a worker is killed or suffers 
bodily harm. It would be five years in prison or and or fifty thousand to five hundred thousand dollar penalty. Now that may be a, uh, an actual deterrent for bad actors who are breaking the law. I it it bothers me to no end that we are even having this discussion. But my peer group, um, other labor leaders from other states that I, I get in calls um, with periodically, those states have passed those weaker laws. And like you said, Tennessee, I mean, it is it is really disturbing to me. I've got kids, I've got grandkids, and I, I just can't imagine them at 13 or 17 doing that kind of work and being yeah. put at risk. It, it just, it's, it's sad and it's sick. It's way out of line, just way out of line. So these bills that you're talking about to increase the penalties, do they have any traction right now? And and I'm sure everybody's concentrated on the election right now, but uh, I'm just wondering, where are you? Where are we with them? Well, as, as luck would have it, there was the Senate in Michigan is not up this cycle. So they're meeting more often than the House, which is up. So the Senate uh, had a hearing on these bills. Did not hear yet. I'm, I'm very confident that they came out of committee and that they will be then put on the floor and passed and teed up for when after the election, the House comes back in and, and they'll be passed. Uh, th- this, this is just, it's wrong. It's absolutely wrong. And these employers who use these practices should be penalized for it. Yeah, come on, eleven hundred dollars for a lost hand. I mean, I mean, it's, it's yeah, just ridiculous. Yeah. Just ridiculous. Yeah, it, it, encur- it encourages that behavior. That's yeah, the problem. Yeah, it yeah, you're right. That behavior. You're right. It, it's it's like a business write off. You know, very sad. Yeah. Very yeah. sad. By the way, we're speaking with Ron Bieber, who is president of the Michigan State Labor Federation. Again, the website is miaflcio.org. Ron, we got a couple of minutes left here, and I want to talk about getting out the vote. And I say this all the time on America's Workforce. That's one thing that labor does and does so very well is getting out the vote. No matter, no matter where you are politically, you got to vote. It is a right. It is a precious right. People died for that right. I like to know what the Michigan State Labor Federation is doing to make sure that people are voting and they're voting for worker friendly candidates. Let's put it at that. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, our job is to educate our members, right, on issues and issues that are important to workers. And we've been doing that. We've done that every cycle. I I always preach, let's start earlier. Let's, you know, let's talk to our members earlier and keep that conversation going. And we did that here. We've, we've been out for at least the last year and a half in our work sites, talking to our members about the issues that matter to them, economic issues, bread and butter issues kitchen table issues. And uh, now we're connecting the dots to which candidates in this election up and down the ballot are the ones who will do the most to protect those issues that they care about. And we asked our our workforce what issues they care about. Um, so now we're out there. We, we, you know, we kind of morphed into election mode instead of uh, issue mode. And now we're, we're, we're talking about candidates to be honest, we're we're doing more this cycle than we've done in many many cycles. Our our contact numbers um, for candidate our uh, members that we've talked to are already past what we've done in previous cycles. So we're out there talking to them. As you said, this is your voice. This is your voice, and I know too that pe- you know people say that they're interested and they're going to vote. And do they really vote? It's that's the million dollar question. In Michigan, I think turnout's gonna it's gonna be tight here and turnout's gonna be the determining factor. So we're we're pushing everybody to to get out, let their voice be heard, and make their make their voice count by voting for these candidates who will have their backs when it comes to issues that matter to working people. We're working hard, Ed. Yeah, I'm sure you are. Everybody's working hard on this one. Worker friendly candidates, vote for your best interest here. All right, Ron, I'm going to leave it on that note. Ron Bieber, president of the Michigan State AFL-CIO. Again, the website, miaflcio.org. You take care, and I'm sure we'll be talking in a couple months to uh, get an update on everything that's happening, the good things that are happening in Michigan, because right to work is no more. Okay, buddy? 
Yeah, thank you so much for having me. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, our independent labor voice, Tom Buffenbarger, will be joining us. Don't go away. You're listening to America's Workforce. This is America's Workforce. It takes Lyuna to keep America running. Over 70,000 public employees are part of Lyuna, the Laborers International Union of North America, delivering critical services such as health care and emergency response, as well as maintaining roads and sanitation systems. Even the National Postal Mail Handlers Union, representing over 47,000 U.S. postal workers, is affiliated with Lyuna. Find out what it takes for Lyuna to keep America running at lyuna.org. That's L-I-U-N-A dot org. Melwood, advancing economic independence for workers with disabilities for more than 60 years. Learn more by visiting melwood.org. The Heat and Frost Insulators and Allied Workers are proud to be a title sponsor for America's Workforce Radio. The Insulators Union is leading the way in the mechanical insulation industry, fire stopping, and infectious disease control. Regarded as North America's energy conservation specialist, these professionals are known for their professional work and dedication. You can learn more about the Insulators Union at insulators.org. America's Workforce is brought to you in part by the United Steelworkers. You can find more at usw.org. America's Workforce is sponsored in part by Boyd Watterson Asset Management, LLC. Find out more about our investment solutions tailored to meet the needs of Taft-Hartley funds at voidwaterson.com. America's Workforce is brought to you in part by the Iron Workers. You can find more at ironworkers.org. Are you looking for a new health care partner for your union members? Let Anthem Blue Cross and Blue Shield be your champion, making sure your members live their healthiest lives now more than ever. It's important to have a partner you can trust, one who understands the unique challenges unions face. Anthem provides a variety of options to meet your organization's needs and helps you control costs without sacrificing quality of care. For more information, visit anthem.com slash labor and trust. Now, back to America's workforce. Here's Ed Flash Ferens. And remember, you can check us out on Facebook or follow us on X, formerly known as Twitter. That would be AWF Union Podcast, AWF Union Podcast. Let's go to line number two. Welcome a dear friend, longtime supporter and contributor to America's workforce, Tom Buffenbarger, former general president of the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers. Go IAM.org is the website. And if you go there, you can read about the uh, tentative agreement that the machinist union out west, there were two uh, two districts, uh, 751 and W24. And these are workers that went on strike on September 13th. Boeing losing $100 million a day finally, <laughs> finally came to their senses. We have a tentative deal. The question is, will the workers ratify it? Tom, welcome back to America's Workforce. Tom, you've been through this before. Talk to me about it. Go ahead. Well, Flash, during my career as president of the machinist, I had four strikes at Boeing. So I follow these contract negotiations very closely. And um, uh, they have a vote coming up tomorrow on a new offer after they've been on strike since September 13th in this round. And um, I know there's a lot of uh, chit-chat out there about, are they going to accept this contract? It looks fantastic. Big pay increases, et cetera. I, I have my doubts because I've watched what's happened in the last 10 years. And there's a lot of anger, there's a lot of frustration, there's a lot of mistrust between the employees, the machinist union members, and the management of that company. And if you remember, it's been GE guys who have been running Boeing since the merger of McDonnell Douglas and Boeing. And they've been playing hardball GE tactics on those employees for many years now. And it's come home to roost. And the anger is so great and the mistrust is so great. I'm not sure this contract proposal, which includes a 35% wage increase, 
It includes an improvement in their 401k. It includes improvement in other standard language in the contract. I'm not sure that's enough movement to guarantee the employees will accept this contract. And if they don't, uh, then the strike will continue. And Boeing's going to have to make more movement coming toward the union's demands. The union is demanding a 40% wage increase. And some say, well, that's kind of outrageous. Well, no, it's not. They haven't had a chance to negotiate their wages for about 10 years since the last deal. Things have built up. Resentment has built up that Boeing would continue not to address their concerns all this time while they could pay their CEOs these outrageous salaries, have stock buybacks where they invest in the management, they don't invest in the employees or the plants, and this is what happens. There comes a time when the relief valve blows, and we saw that happen September 13th. Boeing played hardball for all these years, threatened to move plants, threatened to move work away from Puget Sound, away from Seattle and Portland, Oregon. And they, in fact, delivered on that when they opened a non-union plant in South Carolina, where they build the 787s. So they made good on a threat. They've tried to do it again and again and again. And I think the game is up. The employees are tired of it. And uh, they're going to vent their frustration. And tomorrow is the real test because if the proposed contract goes down, the strike continues. And that will affect the uh, economy not only of Puget Sound, Seattle, Portland, and all the supplier base that goes on there, but it'll affect the whole country because Boeing is the nation's largest exporter. There's only two primary uh, commercial aircraft builders in the world. One is based in Toulouse, France, which is Airbus. The other is in Seattle, Washington. And when you take one of those major producers uh, out of the game for a while, you affect the economy of a whole country and over time, over a whole industry in the world. So it's important to get this uh, contract settled. It's important to understand where the employees are coming from. They have worked hard. They deliver good aircraft. And it's time that they're recognized for it. And that the GE style of labor relations be finally put to bed, buried where it belongs with its creator, Jack Welch, and um, start a new day in labor relations. Um, this vote tomorrow, I'm going to be glued to the news watching what happens. The chatter that's occurring right now on social media uh, that's used by a lot of our members out in the Seattle area indicates that uh, there's it's going to be a tough time to get this contract ratified tomorrow. So we will wait and see, and uh, hopefully both sides will understand they need to go back to the table and move to meet what the employees expect after 10 long years. Tom, there, there's a lot here to uh, to look into. Wages, incentive pay, retirement. You mentioned the 401ks. Apparently, there is a ratification bonus, a one-time bonus of $7,000. I'm just wondering here, I mean, are all of these equally important? You mentioned the, the 40%. They want a 40% wage increase, and they're at 35 right now. If they get to 40%, if, which is not that far away. Do you think this could be a done deal? Flash, I would normally have said yes, but times have changed. The other big issue at the table, and I'm proud of the uh, union leadership there and their efforts to stress the job security part 
of this contract. The employees have now seen Boeing can make good on a threat to move production to another location, and they did it with the 787. So one of the big issues on job security is that the next new designed aircraft, the next new airplane that Boeing builds, will be built in Puget Sound. And to keep the work here, to keep it where it belongs, where the employees deliver uh, the quality aircraft. And if they don't get that, I think that weighs heavily on the employees thinking about the future. It's not just about the here and now or the grievances and problems of the past. It's where do we go in the future? And a new airplane is worth about 30 years worth of work. They're, they're demanding that be addressed in these negotiations. So I don't know if Boeing's gone far enough to guarantee that in the proposal I've read. That's going to be another tough issue for the employees to decide. The issue of their defined benefit pension that Boeing had which was exchanged, it was frozen 10 years ago. So nobody lost it, but it shifted, the primary focus shifted to 401k. Mm -hmm. The reason being the Boeing pension plan was very much underwater and in danger. So the employees voted to do that. And now there's a movement to restore the Boeing pension, the old pension plan, I don't know if it's possible because I think the economics work against that. But they did improve, made substantial improvements in the 401k. I just don't know if that's enough to get the employees to support a contract with that in it. So all the issues are very important issues. They've been thoroughly uh, negotiated there. And I'm sure each side feels that uh, they've taken a hard and fast position and have dug in their heels now. Uh, We'll see what happens tomorrow. That's the ultimate test is when a contract proposal gets to the membership to decide whether it's good enough or not. And um, I think the leadership out there has done a good job trying to bring home a good contract for their members. Tom, you you mentioned that non-union plant in uh, South Carolina, and you and I talked a lot about that because Nikki Haley, who was then governor, lured them over there with a lot of uh, tax incentives. And uh, there was a story, and we talked about this on the show, you may recall, about uh, those planes, those 787s that were produced non-union needed some work because of the workforce there. Again, this is this is a this is definitely something you want to talk about union versus non-union. We know we know what goes into union labor, the skills, the training. Uh, I mean, we talk about this every day on the show, the difference, the difference there. And a lot of those planes went to the union shops to make sure that they were able to fly. You know, is that still pretty much the case? What are you hearing about that? It is. There's still uh, a lot of problems with 787 production in South Carolina. And, uh, you know, the stories are that some customers, especially foreign customers, don't want to take delivery of a 787 until it has been sent to the Seattle factories to make sure everything is proper. So that says a lot about the work our members do in Seattle. I'm not disparaging the workers in South Carolina. They're doing what they're told to do, and it's the management people, and it's the FAA who send those planes out like they are. And if there are problems with them, at least there's some satisfaction provided to the customer that once they've been to Seattle, they have confidence in the unionized workforce in Seattle to deliver a quality airplane. There you go. Now, what happens in the future uh, if the company starts to move to other locations, it's going to be tough for Boeing and tough, even tougher for the customers to do business with Boeing. These are some of the little 
hidden things about the things unions bring to the table. High quality, skilled workforce. You can't just go out and buy that. They tried that in South Carolina. Nikki Haley raided the state's education fund to give tax breaks to Boeing. Boeing builds a plant, starts to build a high-tech aircraft, and finds out they can't get the properly trained or educated workers in the numbers they needed to work there because there's no training for them in that area. And people who were transferred to South Carolina, a lot of the engineers could not wait to leave again because they have kids and families and they looked at the school system in South Carolina and did not want to put their kids into what they felt was an inadequate education system in that state because there was no money for education left. So these are all the little behind-the-scenes things that people need to be aware of. Uh, Be careful of governors who will sell their soul and trade off the wealth of a state, and that certainly lies in the ability to educate the children and the young people. Somebody, a governor who will sacrifice all of that for the short-term boost that they may get in their popularity as politics play out. And that's what Nikki Haley does. She she exchanges good things for bad things, and it's political. And yeah. there's just something wrong with our system that allows that. She's certainly not alone. There's a lot of governors, especially in the South, that have done that. I, I know with the, a lot of the foreign transplants, auto parts, Mercedes, Nissan, we could go on and on and on. But that is why we have you on the show, Mr. Buffenbarger, for the rest of the story, the inside story. And I appreciate your uh, your commentary here. You take care. Stay safe. We'll talk next month. Okay, brother? Best to you, Flash, and all the listeners out there. And that'll be it for another edition of America's Workforce. Tomorrow, the heat and frost insulators and the person who fought for workers' heat protections in the state of Maryland. That and more. Until then, all of you have a safe and wonderful day. That concludes another episode of the America's Workforce Radio Podcast. Thanks for listening, and be sure to subscribe so you never miss a show. America's Workforce is a production of Labor Tools and BMA Media Group. Find out more information online at labortools.com.